Uh, hello, bonjour. Uh, thanks for choosing this session. I'm really glad that you stay that long. Uh, my name is Mike. I build distributed systems for fun and living, uh, but I'm also a Java developer. Uh, and that's why today I would like to talk about the unknown parts of the GUnit 5 library. And you may ask, well, unknown, how is it possible? This GUnit is almost everywhere in almost every Java project out there. Uh, and in fact, it has been released like five years ago, quite a lot of time. Uh, so what's, what's the problem? What's the reason? Is there something wrong with, with the project documentation? Uh, well, in order to answer that, I've took a look at the official JUnit 5 user guide. And you know what? It's awesome. It's full of great stuff. It's really like a really practical thing. Uh, you should really try to read it as well. Uh, so probably if we would all read these fantastic manuals for the tools that we are using, uh, the world would be the better place. The code would be the better place. But it seems not to be the case. And maybe that's good, because people like me have a reason to appear uh, on the DevOps with a new talk. Um, speaking about the talk, so why I took this uh, 1,000 kilometer trip uh, to Paris to be here. Uh, well, I would like to show you some really practical stuff, starting from interesting ways of parameterizing your tests, um, especially with writing data table tests, uh, so something similar that you may know from libraries like Spark. Uh, we'll scratch the surface of customizing test case names. Uh, then I will show you how you can avoid uh, duplication in your test code without using inheritance. And last but not least, I would like to uh, propose some pragmatic way of parallelizing your tests using JUnit 5. Uh, and I have to warn you, at this point, we have a lot of things to cover, so the pace will be rather fast. Uh, but don't worry, at the very end, I will leave you with all the resources that I referred to during the talk. Um, yeah, so let's go. Uh, let's start from the first topic, so from uh, those interesting ways of parameterizing your tests. Uh, and for this purpose, I have an example just for you. So let's imagine a very, very simple pricing engine that is expected to calculate a price of an item. So uh, a price is just a named amount of money, nothing fancy. Um, and this whole calculation is about uh, basically not only subtracting um, the discount that is associated with some marketing campaign uh, from the regular price, but also with some additional business rules saying that we cannot um, hit zero or go uh, under or below zero. Too small. Let me fix that. Let's try this. Is it better? Lovely. Uh, so we want to make sure that we won't go below zero or hit zero, and instead we have to fall back to some minimal non-free price. So like for taxation purposes, let's say. And with such a simple implementation in place, um, we have to come up with some test cases. Uh, so more or less, you could end up with something like that, with three test cases, very simple ones. Like the first one, when we are applying the discount to a regular price, so a happy path, then when we are falling back to the minimal price when the discount is full, so when the discount is the same as the regular price, and the third one when, again, we are falling back to this minimal value when the discount is greater than uh, the regular price. And of course, everything is green, everything is good, the test is passing, uh, but the problem is we have a lot of structural duplication here. What does it mean? So we have three test cases, everything, every, each one of them is checking different thing, but in fact it's doing exactly the same uh, order of operations. So we are setting up the price, then we are setting up a campaign with discount, then we are putting both into the calculator object, and at the very end we are verifying whether the result is what we expected. Uh, so how to avoid such a structural duplication? Well, uh, the JUnit 5 has something as exactly for this purpose, and it's called a parameterized test. So one way of writing such a parameterized test would be to use a so-called method source which means we have a method like this one when we are defining the, the arguments, so the expected inputs and outputs for our tests, and basically passing them to a single, uh, single test method. And it's great because it allows us to avoid this structural application, but it comes with its own problems. Uh, like, for example, the test case names are not that descriptive anymore, and What's even more uh, important, it's pretty boring. So it's something that you may already de do with, uh, even with JUnit 4. So definitely not something that you came here for today. So let me show you uh, a different approach to the same problem. So um, 
The JUnit 5 comes with, oh, sorry, not this one. So JUnit 5 comes with uh, a different approach to test parameterization uh, called a CSV source. So the CSV source allows us to uh, define our inputs and outputs as a comma-separated values. Uh, and that's great because, as you can see, we don't have this additional method anymore, and we still are able to parameterize our tests. Um, and it's nice, it's concise, the readability is not that bad, uh, but of course, the test case names are still um, pretty bad, let's say, comparing to what we had initially. Uh, so let me show you three readability improvements and one magic trick that we can apply here. So, starting from some small improvements. So first, we can replace the standard delimiter, so a comma, with whatever we want, with any character we want. Let's say, let's use pipe instead. Then the second improvement, we could use a text block to uh, define the whole input if our Java version is not the ancient, uh, ancient one. And last but not least, we can apply additional white spaces here and there in order to form a, the, uh, uh, the input uh, in a more readable way. And the test still passes, that's great. There is also one magic trick here. You may have noticed that, maybe not, let's check. So previously, our arguments were just strings and we are the ones um, responsible for converting them into the, um, the correct type, so in this case, amount, uh, using a static method that is accepting a single string parameter. So if you have a situation like that, the JUnit is smart enough to do the cast for you. So we can define our arguments as of type amount directly, and the JUnit will basically do the conversion for us, which is pretty cool. Uh, but of course, we can do more. So one thing that, is, that was missing in the previous approach was the description of each test case. We would like to have a descriptive name. How to start with that? Well, one way of doing so could be to put the description into the input definition itself. Uh, so I just added yet another column with a description. At this point, it does absolutely nothing. But you also might have noticed that we have additional row here, and this is something new added to JUnit 5 which allows you to use a dedicated header row starting from hash that is ignored by, uh, by the CSV source. So we can use it for putting labels or making the, uh, the whole input more readable for us. But we would like to have the description as a part of a test case name. How to do it? Well, the JUnit 5 comes with a, a dedicated annotation called display name. And for regular test cases, the display name allows us to overwrite the default name of the test case. So instead of uh, the name of the method, we could have this uh, nice and business descriptive string. Um, but that works for, uh, for uh, single or singleton uh, test cases. What about the parameterized test? How to do the same? Well, in order to do so, we have to combine two approaches. So again, we will start with the display name, but for the parameterized test, this display name value is actually like a prefix. So it will be the same value for every test case. But we want to parameterize the test case name for every case. So in order to do that, we can use the name parameter of the parameterized test annotation. Uh, and it's really a uh, useful thing because it comes with a very simple templating engine. So in this case, I'm saying let's put an index of a test case, so a number starting from zero, and the value of the third parameter, which is, surprise, surprise, the description itself. Now, please note that the output from the test case is completely different. So now we are talking about some business descriptive names. Uh, it feels like a specification, so it's, it's really uh, something a lot better than we had before. Uh, but of course, it's not everything that we could do with CSV source. Imagine a, very, a, a little bit different example. So we have a duration encoder, so a class that is responsible for encoding a duration in seconds into ISO compatible string like this one. So of course, for defining the test case, we could use the CSV source. Nothing fancy here, or almost nothing fancy. Because please note that, um, that the header row does not start from hash anymore. How is that? How is it possible that it works? Well, actually, there is a dedicated parameter for the CSV source annotation called use headers in display name. And this does not only um, removes the, uh, the need for, uh, for hash, in the, have, uh, in the first row, but also puts the label directly into test case name. So it's a very simple way 
of improving the test case execution output uh, without uh, writing much code. Now, we can take some additional steps. So, JUnit allows us to use a string instead of character as a delimiter. So, instead of uh, a pipe or a comma, I could come with this lovely do-it-yourself arrow. And, of course, if, will, if I will run this test now, it still passes. So, why this is important? Well, first, things like this, this, this nice arrow uh, may be more appropriate in certain contexts, because, for example, it makes it clear that we are converting one value into another. But we could also try to turn our test case into test case definition into some kind of a DSL API. So imagine that instead I will use a delimiter string as a string seconds encoded S. And now every row here feels like a business specification. We are saying 15 seconds should be encoded S and putting the, uh, the expected output. And of course, the test passes, everything is green. But please note uh, that now, if I want to have this, uh, this delimiter being visible within the test case name, I have to specify the name as we did before. So there is no automated way of doing so yet. Going back to the slides. So the CSV source is really powerful stuff, uh, even if it's not that CSV after all, if we'll think about it for a moment, so the name could be a little bit uh, better. But the point is that JUnit 5 loves parameterization. It has been built around the parameterization. Um, but sometimes we have to be creative and use the tools that we have in the appropriate way. Uh, and of course, there is more. Uh, we don't have time to cover things like dynamic test cases, or, uh, for example, parameterizing with enums. But if you are interested, and you should be, uh, just read the user guide. It's awesome. OK, the next topic. So how to avoid inheritance in our test code. And again, I have an example. So imagine that there is a REST API somewhere uh, exposing a single method called foo. We have a single foo endpoint, and this endpoint is expected to return a string anytime when called. So we will have to implement a client, and I did, I did so using the built-in uh, Java HTTP uh, client library. And now with such a client in place, I should probably test it. There are various different ways of doing so, but the approach that I would like to show is to use a tool called Wiremog. So with Wiremog, what we are doing is we are setting up a fake server, we are creating a client pointing to this fake server, and then we are configuring Wiremog uh, like this. We are saying, dear Wiremog, whenever somebody will call slash foo, let's respond with a string bar. So then the test case could look rather straightforward, so we are just calling the client and verifying whether we get bar in return. And again, the test passes, everything is green. So what's the problem? Well, let's jump a little bit uh, to the beginning of the test case. We have quite a lot of initialization code of the boilerplate that's related to setting up the wire mock. So we have to create the wire mock server instance. We have to uh, start it before all the test cases. Then before each test case, we have to reset whatever stops we already put into the wire mock. And last but not least, we have to stop the wire mock server once it's no longer needed. Uh, and the problem will be quite significant, it will have multiple classes using Wiremog. We'll easily end up with these pieces of code being spread across all the code base. We don't want to do it. How to avoid that? Well, the straightforward way, and I believe like each one of you have seen such an approach, is to create a base class. So we, have, we keep the test case where it was before, but we move the initialization code as it was to a different class, and now this class is abstract, and we are saying you have to implement this class uh, in your Wiremog test. So where is the problem? Well, the problem is that Java does not allow us to inherit from multiple different classes. So if you will have a database or a message broker, you will easily end up with multiple different base test classes for each one of them. And then what's even worse, you will need in some cases, both, like database and wire mock. So we will have to create with base wire mock with database class. And it's got worse and worse. So how to avoid this, uh, this hell 
of inheritance. Well, what if I tell you if we could use the approach that we had here, but only adjust it a bit? So what, what do I mean? Let's keep the content of the class almost as it was, but convert the class to a non-abstract one and make it implement three interfaces coming from JUnit 5. One is called before all callback, then we have before each callback, and we have after all callback. And each of these interfaces comes with a single method that maps to a proper lifecycle step. So we have a before each method that is like the same as the at before each. Uh, we have after all, and we have before all. So I just converted the code a little bit. Now, the question is, how, do I, how could I use it in my test case? So I have to apply it somehow, and we know that the inheritance is not the way. And now, I believe this one. So we need, yeah, of course, as with JUnit 5, we need yet another annotation called extend with. So yeah, we just created a very simple JUnit 5 extension. It's that simple, like implementing through methods, nothing else. And just see, we can run the test, and now, it works. So the, the wire mock has been started and it has been cleaned up, like everything we had before. The only thing that I don't like in this approach is that I still need to get the instance of the wire mock server in order to point the client to it. So right now I have a static method that is pointing to, to this wire mock server. But I don't like it. And I don't like it because it doesn't feel like an extension. I have to be aware that there is such an extension. Luckily, there is yet another interface that we could implement called Parameter Resolver. And Parameter Resolver is a nice thing to implement a very simple dependency injection in your test cases. Uh, what do I mean? Let's jump to the test case. Just see this one. Let me prove that it's, wor it it's working. So now the Wiremock server instance is being injected by the extension. So we don't have to know how the extension works. We are just saying, please give me the Wiremock server instance. And of course, we did it using two methods that are part of this parameter resolver interface. So there is supports parameter and resolve parameter. And you can think of it this way. So supports parameter is just a simple filter saying whether or not this extension is, uh, um, is knows how to inject a certain type of parameter. And then we have resolve parameter, which is basically providing a proper value once uh, we know that the type is uh, already supported. That's simple. And what is even more interesting is that if I will type wiremock extension, oh, extension, live typing, sorry. So this is a class that is part of the wiremock API itself. Just take a look, how does it look like? So the official extension that is doing more or less the things that we just implemented is implemented in the same way. So all the extensions look like that. It's really, really simple. And there is almost no need not, uh, or almost no reason why we shouldn't use them. So the extensions are simple, as I said, like extremely simple. And there is, in my opinion, almost no need to use base classes anymore. But of course, there's more. Uh, for example, you can use uh, default methods in interfaces to implement tests, implement all the, uh, the methods that I've shown you uh, with, with, the base, uh, with the base class. Uh, but again, I feel that the extensions are like the, the best thing or the best approach uh, available at the moment. But still, if you are interested, surprise, surprise, read the user guide. It's awesome. Now, time for the last topic. So the, uh, my pragmatic proposal for test parallelization. And when talking about parallelizing tests, uh, we often think that we should parallelize all of them. And it feels like a good idea, but at the very end, it's easier said than done. Uh, especially in the projects, like majority of projects that are around for months or years, you have a lot of test code, and it's not that easy to turn it into parallel one at once. So does it mean that we are forced to use all or nothing approach? 
Well, luckily not, thanks to the still experimental part of the GUnit 5 API that I would like to show you. So there is a dedicated annotation called execution. And this execution controls how the test execution node, like a class, test class, or a test case, so a test method, is being executed. By default, everything happens on the same thread, which effectively means that we are executing those things sequentially. But we can use execution mo mode concurrent to say, please execute it in parallel. Luckily, uh, in many cases, it's not enough to duplicate this, sorry, this, application, uh, this annotation, uh, because if we'll apply it on the test class level, it will propagate down to all test cases. And that's pretty interesting, because it means that we can parallelize what we want instead of doing it for, uh, for all the test cases we have. But the question is what we should parallelize. Well, there are, var there are differences depending on the test, case, uh, the test types. So the unit tests are usually the easiest one to parallelize because they are already as isolated, they are relatively simple, uh, but they won't give you a huge boost in terms of performance. On the other hand, if you would manage to parallelize your end-to-end -end tests, the heavy ones, you will get a lot of performance boost, but of course, usually it means more and more work. So my proposal of doing so would be as follow. Let's parallelize the unit tests by default. It's a low-hanging fruit in terms of test par parallelization. But about the rest, let's parallelize them one once they are ready. So one by one, They'll just delay this decision. And what's more important, keep the configuration directly in the code, directly in the test code. How to do it? Let me show you yet another example that I prepared. So this example will start from, surprise, JUnit 5 configuration file. Yeah, there is something like that. You can put a file called JUnit platform properties uh, in your resources to configure various different things about the JUnit 5 execution engine. Uh, so what we will do here is we will enable the parallel execution. At this point, it means absolutely nothing. It doesn't change anything uh, apart from enabling the new API. And then I would like to make sure that by default we are using the old behavior, the sequential one, run everything on the same thread. Now, this means that if we have a standard test case, so just a class with a test case annotated with a test, it will still run as usual, one by one. And yeah, this artificial delay that I added here, it's only for presentation purposes. It's not something you want in your, uh, in your test, that's for sure. Now, what about the parallelized tests? Well, the only difference is this annotation, parallelizable test. It is not a part of GUnit 5 API, but it's my own wrapper. And why I think this, is, this might be a good idea. Well, it's a wrapper over the execution with execution mode concurrent. But the difference, there are two differences, basically. One is that I'm limiting the scope only to the type. So I want to avoid a situation when everything in my test cases is annotated with, uh, with those um, annotations. Because as I said, it's enough to put this annotation on top of a test class to parallelize everything down there. Then I'm making sure that I'm using the default lifecycle for JUnit test cases. So by default, JUnit creates a copy of a test class for every test case that is being run to improve the isolation. And I just want to explicitly say, yeah, let's use it. This is a good thing for parallelizing my tests. So then if I will run one of those parallelized tests, you will see that they are being run in parallel, which is exactly what we wanted. Now let me run all of them at once. And what we should observe, and luckily this is the case, then we are starting multiple different test cases at the same time, and then executing them uh, in parallel, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve. Now, please note that the sequential ones are also executed together with the parallelized ones, but the difference is that the sequential ones are always executed on the same thread. So in this case, it's worker one, like here, and like here, for example, which means that they are, in fact, being executed one by one. So it's exactly what we wanted to achieve. Again, going back to the slides. So this approach is nice because it allows you to start small with evolution approach, so avoiding a big bang in your code base. Uh, but of course, it leaves us with the trade-offs between speed 
and, uh, and the effort that we are ready to, to put into parallelizing our tests. And that's almost all from my side. We almost ran out, out of time. Uh, if you are interested about the details, I uh, created two articles just about that that you can find on my blog. Uh, and all the resources, including those blog articles, are available here. And don't worry, at the very end of the session, I will leave this slide open. So uh, you can take a picture now or later, or not at all, if you're not interested. Uh, and in, but in this case, I would say you should still read the GUnit 5 user guide. Uh, and that's all from my side. Merci. Thank you. Yeah, so we have five minutes, almost five minutes for, for questions. So if there is anything that I could help you with, just feel free to ask. No questions. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. First, um, we in, in my team we are. Um, moving tests from GUnit 4 to GUnit 5. And one of the limitations is that there is no um, parameterization at the class level anymore. Um, and we have test classes uh, parameterized, but with a lot of small tests uh, testing different parts of the, of the class. And in GUnit 5, we cannot do that anymore. Do you have some mitigation for that? I'm not sure if I understood correctly your case. Could you try to rephrase it a little bit? Uh, we have uh, one test test class, one uh, yes, one test class with parameterization. So uh, inputs um, uh, like uh, all the all the parameters for the for starting the application, some configuration and the outputs we want, and a lot of small tests uh, testing different parts of the of the class, but they are all sharing the same parameterization. In Unit 5, uh, we don't have that anymore. So you're trying to parameterize uh, like the system itself, like using different uh, parameters, let's say for Spring, for example. You would like to use some different context for different test case. Am I right? Or S uh, Probably. I don't know Spring, but uh, yeah, probably. OK. So I'm not sure if I uh, understood it correctly. So maybe we can like talk a little bit in more details uh, after the session. Uh, but yeah. so. There are some certain ways that are still like hard to uh, to do. Uh, so, for example, like recently, I was trying to implement the test case that uh, well, I would like to have a single test case, but with two different sets of uh, of Spring configurations. And the only way of doing so, at, at least the, the one that I found, would be to basically like have a again a base class or something, and then have a dedicated test that is like annotated with. The, the special configuration uh, and overriding, like sorry, implementing the same uh, the same base class, like two times. But it's it doesn't feel uh, feel good. Maybe one of the solutions for you, but I'm not sure how your code base looks like, might be to use dynamic test 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 cases. So with dynamic tests, you can actually parameterize or pub or configure your test cases in runtime. So you have a little bit more control over what you could do and how to make certain decisions. It changes a bit the way of how you are implementing those, uh, those tests, but it's still possible. I would recommend to take a look at this functionality. I'm not sure whether it will solve your problem, but maybe it's a good starting point, at least. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was awesome. I have seen that you are using the approach uh, BDD, which is the given when then style for unit test. Um, I wanted just to do a suggestion because I, with Mokito, I discovered that there is a library which is BDD Mokito that you can align your syntax of the test uh, exactly with this BDD style, and they are look they look nicer. So just this little point. 
yeah, and point taken. Uh, like, thanks for bringing the dub. Uh, the BDD assertions for, for Makita are also uh, quite nice. Uh, so it's a bit a matter of taste, of course. Uh, I just wanted to keep things simple, like to use the, uh, the APIs that are, in my opinion, like the most popular out there. But of course, if you want to go into the right direction of uh, BDD style of writing the test case, you definitely should try this, uh, this API. I totally agree. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I will be around if you will have any questions. If not, just enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.